I'm in the Angra Tauli Reserve Forest of South Garo Hill. This is India's international border with Bangladesh, completely unguarded and unchecked. And this is the route that NDAP and Alpha militants take to carry their arms. Ethnic and communal clashes have been creating internally displaced people all across the state. This being the latest one. But to identify this violence, one must recognize the pressure on land and on occupation. A market area, the Big Bazaar Mall, one of the blasts took place right in front of this area. The other two blasts were also in residential areas and market areas. 7th of May, the militants had chosen exactly the same place to derail a train carrying rice. The day before we arrived, they fired on two trains and damaged the track out here by removing the rails and felling trees behind me. This is India's international border with Bangladesh. Of Bihari's fleeing homes. More than 80% schools across the state are affected. We finally arrived in CPI Maoist. You are relieving one of the hospitals. Well, I told him that uh, I'm very fine, that I'm fit. A trail of destruction left behind by a cyclone on National Highway 44. Kishala Barajaji for NDT. Any kind of a discussion with them about it? Did you try and explain to them what was their response? Some kind of discussion, but I don't like to get into politics because I know that the political men are, I say, intoxicated by politics. Looking forward to making the call home. I think the call that he was waiting uh, for hours, actually, not just days. I mean, probably he's counted it in minutes. You know, when I was growing up, I grew up in the 70s and 80s. It was a time of very critical political and social upheavals, not only in the Indian subcontinent, but also in the rest of the world. If you ever think of that decade, in 1962, we had the Chinese war in which India lost. In 1965, India went to war with Pakistan, won it. From 1967 to 1971, a small little peasant uprising in a remote tea garden in eastern India, called Naxal Bari, spread the red star over India and the effect that we are experiencing even today. In 1971, India again went to war with Pakistan to liberate Bangladesh. Millions and millions of refugees poured into India. And in 1975, India sank into its worst, darkest period, the emergency. That is the time that our just after that, that I was growing up, when pictures had a very important part in our lives. The governments and the military dictators were saying something else, and the pictures were showing us something else. You remember, the Vietnam War was raging. The civil rights movement was going on. And if you can recollect those iconic anti-war Vietnam pictures, which actually turned the American nation against their own, uh, own selves, now, so that is how the power of the picture you know, had an influence on people like me. I understood that the power of the documentary picture and ground zero journalism had the ability to relate and transmit what was on the ground. And that was very important. Because by the time I came uh, into journalism and I started chronicling and documenting stories, means of transmission had become much easier. The world was getting closer and closer, but the war was far from over. Three decades later, even today, thousands of people are being killed in Syria. Even as we are speaking, people are being bombed on Gaza. But something has changed. Due to technology, the governments can no more hide what is going on. The power of that documentary photography, the power of the ground zero journalism, is the power that actually is very anti-war. Because 
That's the only means, that's the only medium to reveal the true face of war. And in a sense, tell the world, relate to the world, convey to the world the voice of those who are not otherwise heard. And in that, probably stimulate public opinion. To that effect, I was doing my work. We were going to the edges, places where otherwise you wouldn't go, to bring back stories of suffering, to bring back stories of grief, inconsolable grief. I want to take you on a visual journey of some very disturbing images. One of the most enduring images of my more than 20 years of covering conflict is this man holding an office bag, his shirt soaked in blood. I was standing next to him. Moments before this picture was clicked, 40 people died around him. Dismembered limbs, people were crying, screaming, 200 people injured. The look on his face is completely numbed. He's stunned by the fact that he's still alive. Now, what you see, or what I see on the ground out here is immediate. What I experience is unmitigated pain, misery, grief, insanity. You don't see that. You see the picture only on a newspaper page. You see images of a video on a television screen, which are mostly edited or censored. But what is seen on the ground is far more immediate. There are more images which I will not explain, but these are images, terrible images, terrible images of human misery. And my job wasn't a pleasant job. My job was to cover conflict. When you cover conflict, you have a lot of anger in you. Because I don't know how many of you, though you all are from Manipur and your experience are completely different from the experience of the rest of the country, but have you ever seen a mother sitting in front of children, her face being blown up by a burst of fire? It happened a month ago in our region. Have you ever seen rows of children and women being slaughtered, hacked into pieces? Have you ever seen what white phosphorus does to a face of a child? Have you ever seen a mother pick up, cut pieces of a child into her hand, running across the street? I wish each of you out here and everybody else had an opportunity to see this. Because if you, see, if you had seen this, you would know that nothing, nothing in this world is worth letting things go out of control so that we start killing people in this manner. While I was, and many of my tribe, was out covering these stories, capturing these images, bringing home the stories of death, destruction, desolation, displacement. We unconsciously had stepped on a very slippery stone, which is why I'm here today. The theme of the talk today is how I have failed in, can you move the pictures? In, in, an, eff, in an effort to bring you images and stories for which I am supposed to be doing, I realized that I was stepping on a very, very dangerous stone. And that stone which leads us into an abyss the stone is the danger of a single story. The nature of the beast is such that in my profession, I go only to cover conflict. I go only to cover when people are in em emergency. I go only to cover when roads are on fire. I go to cover when people have lost their homes. When people have lost their children. 
when mothers have lost their sons. When in front of a festival in your town out here, a rickshaw puller gets blown up. These are the images I am supposed to be covering and I covered to the best of my ability. But what I failed was to not cover Reuben crafting indigenous equipment from his oral literature and playing music. What I didn't cover was Shanti's ability to beat the world from abject poverty. I did not cover those stories because I wanted to cover those stories. And that is the danger of the single story. What the impact of the single story is that it dispossesses you. It strips you of dignity. What happens is that you, people sitting out here, are seen as people who are xenophobic, who are militant, who are aggressive. So when you travel outside, people look and hear your stories with distrust, with suspicion. And people like me have largely contributed to that. And we need to set our record straight. How do we do that? And that is when I was confronted with the difficulty, with the challenge of representing people without the stereotypical images. Over a period of 20 years, over a period of 25, 30 years, if a region is represented only through images of violence, then the only image stereotype that is formed of this across uh, the country, if not uh, beyond that, would be violent. It's important to report this. It is extremely important. It's urgent to report this. It's important for me to be able to grab these images so that I can shake the collective conscience of people to grab your attention, to make you stand up, sit up and protest. But while doing that, we cannot forget the other stories. And that is when I thought of writing this book. And in this book, I tried to weave together fragmentary expressions of people their, their stories of their suffering, stories of their struggles, stories of how they fell in love, stories of food, stories of music, stories of marriages between curfews, curfew or relaxation hours, marriage, uh, stories of funerals. I mean, it was important to report death, it was important to report widows of conflict, it was important to report child soldiers, it was important to report drug money, grief, arms, wildlife crime, everything was there, but it was also important to carry the voice of the people out here who were celebrating life every day. The celebration of life that people in these areas, in the conflict zones, do against the severest odds, that is something that we had missed out in the last 20, 25 years. And, you know, that, that is why, now these are the pictures that I wanted to juxtapose with the pictures of violence that you just now saw. You know, a couple returning home in a, what, is, what is otherwise known Maoist corridor. They look happy. It's a story that we otherwise wouldn't report, but it is important to report their stories too, of how they eke out their happiness against the odds. Stories of beautiful houses in the middle of conflict. They paint their houses. You know, something otherwise we wouldn't observe. You know, children. This, is, this woman, her husband is in jail alleged to be a Maoist. She's delivered a baby and the village is celebrating the baby's naming ceremony the day I was there. It's an interesting photograph. The smile on her face. It's important 
to tell those stories as well. Because what we do otherwise is that we form ourselves into clusters, we get into ghettos, we suffer from perceived victimhood. And how do you, how do you break those barriers? You break those barriers by stories. Stories have the ability to punch holes in your mental walls and to give you a glimpse of what is on the other side so that there is a possibility of a reconciliation. Because remember in a conflict, in a war, the stakes are very high and everybody is involved. And the only way reconciliation can happen is through stories. Stories that reveal the true face, but as well as the stories that reveal what is, you know, apart from war, what else people are doing. And that is where in this book, I have this wonderful story, I won't have time today to relate, of an army officer who returned to a village in Taming Long 16 years later. 16 years back, he had helped save the village and the village saved him. It's a fascinating story of how this army officer, the village discovered this army officer. He came back out here. They adopted him as a son of the land. And you know what he had done? On a crossfire with some militants, two of them uh, were apprehended. One of them was killed. One of them had escaped. His gun had stopped firing and he was shot. A grenade hit him on the leg and bullets hit him on his chest and he was almost dying. He was bleeding. He was, his head was on the headman's lap. The entire village was there. Those days in the 80s, village after village would be wiped out. There wouldn't be any media, neither any human rights. The commandant over radio had given him the order to fire indiscriminately and kill everybody in the village. When a soldier dies in our country, there is a law which gives him a a dying wish which is played to his mother so they generally carry a small little dictaphone or tape recorder and there's a photograph where the Jawans are holding the tape recorder to him and in his dying wish the soldier said not a single person in this village is going to be touched not a single of the militants captured are going to be tortured the Jawans did not know how to react because this is not how a, no, normally a soldier would react. He told the commandant that I am the commander on the field and this is my dying wish. When the aircraft came to pick up, uh, to evacuate him because he was almost dying, he, he saw the two children who were also lying on the ground, not fatally wounded, but they were caught in the crossfire. He told the pilot, that the two children should be taken first. The pilot said, I don't have permission to take civilians. I can only take you and you are anyway, you know, bleeding profusely. And he again said that this is my dying wish. You have to take the children first. So the children were taken. The aircraft came back, took him back. He survived, injured, battle wounded. And the village imagined that he would have died. And after 16 years, they found out that he was alive. I traveled with him to the village in Taming Long. And it was a moment, uh, a very emotive moment. Everybody in the village won tears. Because it was a moment where you confront a situation, you realize that there was this man who helped save us. And the climactic moment of that day was a short middle-aged man with a longish coat like a farmer's coat and a farmer's trouser came up to him and asked him can you show where did the bullet hit you and I was standing next to him and the soldier opened and said the bullet hit me here and he peered into the injured part of the shoulder and he said but I hit you here how did the bullet hit you here And you had the soldier and this man embrace each other. Both came very close to killing each other. One man's gun stopped working. The other man hit it at the right spot, but it ricocheted. Why it ricocheted, I won't tell you. Maybe you'll read the book and find out how and why it happened. But 
why I mentioned this is that it was important to, to give this story as well. Because otherwise you have a stereotype of, you know, uniformed people who are more, uh, you know, intolerant. And out here you have somebody who has actually uh, shown how it, what it means for, a, for, you know, a human, a human spirit. So, while it is important, and I reiterate the fact that it is important for people to reveal the true face of war, conflict, to bring home those images which disturb you, it is also important not to get trapped in the single story. It is important to report everything. And what we failed doing over the last two, three, and three decades, I suppose we need to set that right. I suppose we need to set that right to be able to defy the notion of stereotype, to defy prejudice and effect discrimination. So what you see and what you talk about, what you hear about prejudice, discrimination, uh, stereotype are effects of stereotypical images which are perpetrated and which can be juxtaposed or at least balanced with stories of the other kind. And that is why today my I Valley wish is that a vital story needs to be told every day and must be told every day given our new network of globalized exchange of ideas and inspiration. We must reach out to a tolerant, peaceful new world order. Thank you.